Homeostasis is the existence of a stable internal environment. So we're talking about what happens inside the body, not what happens outside the body. But if we were talking about homeostasis of the outside world, we would maybe talk about a nice sunny bright day with no storms in sight. That would be a stable environment. But we're talking about the inside of the body, and so we're talking about keeping things in a stable condition inside the body, like keeping the oxygen content uh, normal within a certain range, or keeping the pH of the tissues within a certain range, or keeping the body temperature within a certain range. Now um, homeostasis can be regulated through one of two ways. It can be regulated automatically, and that we call autoregulation. And autoregulation is something that is done right locally at the cells, or at the tissues, or even at the organ. This is the type of regulation that will adjust things automatically in response to an environmental change. For an example, when oxygen levels go down in a tissue, then the blood vessels in that tissue area will start to dilate and bring more blood to the area, and then the blood contains oxygen and will um, give the tissues more oxygen. So it kind of gets auto-regulated right at the tissue level. The other type of homeostasis that we have is called extrinsic. And extrinsic is the type of regulation that is done with either the nervous system or the endocrine system. Now the nervous system is going to direct more rapid short-term responses. So those are rapid and short-term. And so this might be uh, an example of touching a hot stove. So you put your hand down on a hot stove, the tissues start to burn and get damaged, and what's going to happen is that um, you're going to pull your arm away from that uh, so that you can save the tissues and the tissues can remain in homeostasis. So that would be an example of the nervous system. It's very short term, it's very rapid. An example of the endocrine system is going to be something that's more long term, and uh, long term changes include things like growth and development, and so the endocrine system sends out these hormones, which are chemical messengers, to tell the body how to adjust to these changes as the body grows and the body develops. Also, in more abnormal situations, if the body is going through starvation, then the endocrine system will send out hormones to help adjust to the changes that occur in the body when the cells aren't getting enough nutrients. Homeostasis is going to be regulated using three different parts, and it doesn't matter what type of regulation we're using. Uh, they would all use a receptor, and a receptor is a sensory organ that will pick up any change in the environment, and the receptor will send that information to a control center. The control center is typically the brain, the brain will receive that information, interpret what's going on, and then send out a command. And that command will go to an effector organ, and the effector then will make the change. So in the example of touching a hot stove, the receptors would be found in the fingertips, and you touch the hot stove, the sensory receptors um, pick up that information that that is painful, sends the information to the control center, which is the brain, the brain will interpret that as pain, and then will send a command out to the effectors. The effectors will be the muscles in your arm, and your arm will pull away from the stove, um, bringing your hand away from the stove so that you can stop the damage to the tissues. And that is regulation, and those are the three different types of regulation. There are also two different types of feedback that occur during any stimulus, and we have negative feedback, and we also have positive feedback. Different examples of negative feedback are going to be things like, well, if oxygen content went down, if there wasn't enough oxygen in the tissues, the body would respond by increasing the amount of oxygen in the tissues through various steps. If the pH in the tissues went down and the tissues became too acidic, then the body would oppose that and then would cause changes that would increase the pH of the tissues. Another example of negative feedback would be body temperature. If body temperature went up, and so it went above the normal range, then your body would respond to make changes to decrease the body temperature. And that is negative feedback. Every single time we have a stimulus, and then the response is the exact opposite of the stimulus. Decrease pH, increase pH. Increase body temperature, decrease body temperature. 
So the response is always opposite of the stimulus. We'll look at positive feedback in a minute. Here's an example of body temperature. Now we see down here that body temperature is typically in a range. The ideal body temperature would be 37 degrees Celsius, but we can't always keep it right at 37 degrees Celsius, so we'll have a range. And the range of our body temperature is typically between 36.7 to 37.2 degrees Celsius. And the body temperature will be maintained within that range, and that would be considered normal. If the body temperature gets outside of that range, then certain homeostatic regulatory mechanisms would have to be put in place to bring it back down into the normal range. Well, let's take a look at what happens in the case of um, body temperature. Here we have homeostasis. Homeostasis is normal body temperature, so we're looking again at 36.7 to 37.2 degrees Celsius. Okay, the body temperature starts to rise. Why is it rising above 37.2? Well, it could be anything from a fever, or maybe it's even something as simple as exercise, or maybe you're outside in the hot sun. In whatever case, we start to see that the body temperature rises above the 37.2 degrees Celsius. When that happens, there are receptors that we find in the skin and in the brain uh, in particular in the area called the hypothalamus. And those receptors are going to pick up that information and detect that the temperature is rising. And then that will send information to the control center, and the control center is in the brain. The control center here is the thermal regulatory center in the brain. This center in the brain is going to receive that information, interpret it, and then will send out a command to the effector. The effector, in the case of body temperature, will be sweat glands, in the skin and also blood vessels in the skin. So the sweat glands are going to start to sweat and release fluid and then that fluid will evaporate carrying with it some of the heat and so we're able to get rid of the, some of the heat that way. The blood vessels in the skin will dilate too bringing more of the blood to the surface of the skin so that more of the heat can be dissipated through the environment. And these effects then of the effectors the response will be that the heat in the body will be lost and it will bring the body temperature back down to normal body temperature which was 36.7 to 37.2 degrees Celsius. Now in the case of positive feedback this is going to be exactly opposite of what negative feedback was. In this case instead of having a response that opposes the original stimulus we're going to have a response that will exaggerate or enhance the original stimulus. Positive feedback is pretty rare in the body. We don't see it a whole lot. Uh, it's not needed a whole lot. Instead, negative feedback is usually used. But there are a couple of circumstances in which uh, positive feedback would be very useful. The first one's blood clotting. If we take a look at this blood vessel, we can see that there's been a cut in the blood vessel wall. And this is going to lead to blood leaking out of the blood vessel, so we have to stop that. What happens is that the tissues in the blood vessel will start to release chemicals these chemicals will start to promote the process of blood clotting. So here we start to see some blood clotting take place and that's all happening because of those chemicals that were released. This blood clotting then will cause even more chemicals to be released and this will accelerate the clotting process and then accelerating the clotting process will cause more chemicals to be released in which case we'll get even more clotting. And so we end up with this positive feedback loop. We have more chemicals being released, we have more clotting that occurs, and then more chemicals being released, and then more clotting will occur. So this is positive. It's where the original stimulus, which is the chemicals being released, will cause even more of the response, which is clotting and more chemicals to be released. So in that case, it's good to have that positive feedback. Now, if we had negative feedback in this case, that would not be good. We'd have chemicals to be released, and then through our negative feedback loop, those chemicals would then be decreased, and then clotting would stop. Another example of positive feedback would be labor and delivery. In labor and delivery, we're talking about two different structures, the uterus itself, and also the cervix, which is the opening of the uterus. Now, in labor and delivery, the uterus has to contract to be able to push the baby out and the cervix has to dilate to create a wide enough opening for the baby. So what happens is that the cervix will start to dilate and then the chemicals that are released will cause the cervix to dilate even more and then more chemicals will be released causing the cervix to dilate even more until we get to about 10 centimeters of dilation. 
With a uterus what happens is that a contraction will occur because of some hormones and then more hormones will be released causing a greater contraction and the greater contraction will cause more hormones to be released causing even a greater contraction until finally we get to a strong enough contraction and strong enough contractions that are close enough together in order to deliver the baby.